This video will show my workshop and I'll share with you some storage and organization ideas. I'll even give a brief demonstration of some of the specialized tools I use for creating projects. My workshop is a 30 by 14 and a half foot space located in my walkout basement. I often wish for a bigger space, but I'm thankful that it's climate controlled year round and just a few feet away from my office and computer. It has a bathroom for cleaning up after a busy day, and it has an exterior window for ventilation. Adjacent to the workshop is what I call the boardroom. It contains my desk collector and heavy shelving for lumber storage. It also contains a big cart for storing sheet goods, turning blanks, and short lumber stock. Before we take a look at my workshop, I would like to show you where most of my projects begin. Here at my computer. I'll give you a quick demo of two software tools I use for designing most of my segmented wood turning projects. The first one is Woodturner Pro. The first step is to use the 3D Design Pro module to sketch the basic shape of the vessel. Essentially it's like a dot to dot drawing you made when you were a kid. The program makes a 3D depiction of the design on the right half of the screen. I can move the dots around to smooth out the contours and adjust the shape. Next we'll switch to the Woodturner Pro module to create the layers of segments. You'll define the thickness and number of segments per layer and the software does the rest. Click the Profile Snap button to see what the bowl will look like. This step calculates the size of the segments for each row. Here you can get a rough idea of what the bowl will look like. We can even go into each layer and change the species of wood. Here I'm going to select Walnut for the top rim of the bowl. And maybe just for fun, choose another row here to make a different color. Say, let's make that out of Bloodwood. There you go. Now you can see a bowl that's taking shape. Now let's make this a little fancier. Let's uh, select an individual segment and change it to Cherry. There we go. Now let's try rotating it. Boy, that's sure not the best looking bowl. Let's play with this a bit more. Let's make a few other segments likewise cherry and see if we can develop a little pattern and see what that looks like. Well, that's better. Sure not a prize winner. It doesn't follow the golden ratio or the rule of thirds, but it gets the idea of what this software can do. One of the best features of this software is that it calculates all segment widths, lengths, and angles so you don't have to. Here you can see one of the layers in detail. The window up in the upper left shows all cut lengths, widths, and angles for that layer. For most bowls, however, it will be much more useful to print the cut list shown here. With that list in hand, I'll be able to head for the workshop to make the segments. SketchUp is another program I use for woodworking and general home improvement projects. It's used extensively by architects and product designers for modeling 3D designs. The basic version of SketchUp is free, so it's a popular tool for woodworkers. Here is the design I made for the privacy screen on my deck. With SketchUp I can rotate the view to show all sides of the structure. Components, like the posts, can be copied and pasted as you develop the design and expand it. I used SketchUp several years ago to help redesign our master bathroom. Here's the SketchUp drawing I made to lay out the ceramic tile. The software can cut away the wall layers to get a good view of the interior of the space. One nice thing about SketchUp is the extensive online users groups that have created thousands of standard component drawings ranging from appliances and bathroom fixtures to nuts, bolts, and industrial machines. I've used SketchUp for several woodworking projects and last year discovered a new use for it in designing segmented ribbon sculptures. This one, as you may recall, I named Ad Astra. I used SketchUp to figure out the bowl sections I needed to create the desired shape. I made a component library with several dozen custom shapes that I can use in future designs. SketchUp does a lot of the work for me, but I still have to know how to run that lathe. 
I would be remiss if I didn't recognize one of my favorite design tools, my trusty Texas Instruments SR51A calculator I bought in 1975. By the way, the SR in the model number stands for slide rule. We'll have a lesson on that someday in the future. Enough talk about technology. Let's go to the workshop. First, we'll pass through the board room, where I have enough boards and turning blanks to keep me busy for a long time. The shelves hold boards, turning blanks, and on the floor, boxes contain cutoffs of several different wood varieties. And yes, even more boards are piled on the floor because I ran out of shelves a long time ago. The portable cart holds short boards, pen blanks, and sheet goods, mostly Baltic birch plywood and MDF for making jigs. I tend to collect exotic wood in the form of pen blanks, it seems, like this piece of black and white ebony. And of course you can never have enough K-State purple. My dust collector sits behind my lumber cart. By putting the dust collector in this room, I can greatly reduce the noise level in my main workshop. The system began its life as a portable Delta dust collector. I just don't have room in my small shop though to roll a dust collector around from tool to tool, so I decided to install ductwork to make a permanent system. I disassembled my dust collector and reconfigured it with a large cartridge filter. The original cloth bag was rated at 5 microns but this filter traps dust as small as 0.25 microns. I turned the original impeller section on its side and mounted it above a Thane separator that catches nearly all the dust before it ever reaches the cartridge filter. I built this type of system because I don't have enough vertical space for a cyclone type dust collector. I connected the motor to a wireless motor starter that works throughout my shop via a remote control. A clear plexiglass window lets me see when I need to dump the dust and shavings. The main dust collector duct is a 6 inch metal pipe that passes over the wall into the workshop. Now let's go inside the workshop to see where the fun happens. A large beam and its vertical support posts make tool arrangement a challenge at times, but those also are great places for dust collector drops and electrical wiring. As you can see, there's not a lot of empty space. The primary duct splits in two directions and is controlled with large blast gates. Each tool has its own blast gate, so activating dust collection for a particular tool only takes a few seconds, provided I don't misplace the remote control, of course. One of the first items I built for my first real workshop 40 years ago was this workbench. It served me well all these years, with a few modifications along the way. It still has the original hardboard skin on the top surface, which I considered replacing. However, I resisted that temptation due to the special memories it holds. Take, for example, the silver paint my young son spilled when he was painting a 4-H rocket project. Last year I decided it was time to get better organized, so I built a center drawer for drawing supplies and I added some drawer dividers to all the other drawers. Here you can see the before and after views to show what a difference that made. Another improvement I made was to add 8 inch shelves between the two workbench pedestals and then placed shoebox sized plastic storage boxes there to hold tool accessories and other small parts. Now things like jigsaw blades and rotary tool accessories are easy to find. At this end of the shop I have a 12 inch disc sander, an oscillating spindle sander, and a stationary belt sander. I designed and built a sander cart to hold these things plus my portable sanders and sanding supplies. Over here I have a second workbench used mostly for assembly work and storing lathe accessories. All right, when I'm not making workshop tour videos, it's covered with assorted junk and clutter. 
A recent improvement a couple years ago was his roll-around storage cart that contains a small air compressor and a vacuum pump for use with vacuum chucks on the lathe. The cart keeps those units clean, stores hoses and accessories, and greatly muffles the noise. I use the cart as a work surface when sanding projects on the lathe. I made a half inch lip around the top to prevent lathe tools from rolling off. I relocated the compressor's pressure gauge and regulator to the front panel and the vacuum pump's gauge and relief valve as well. Quick connect fittings make it easy to attach hoses. And check out those snazzy custom turned knobs. Next to that workbench is the bandsaw. An air filter hangs from the ceiling to clean the air of dust the dust collector misses. Lighting is an important part of my workshop. My grandfather's farm got electricity in the 1930s and he made do with what he had to light his workshop. While I don't use his light fixture in my shop anymore, it brings back good memories of him. I wired my shop with ceiling receptacles into which I plug four-foot fixtures. This allows me to move the fixtures around as needed with no rewiring. I originally had fluorescent fixtures throughout, but have since replaced many of them with more efficient LED fixtures. My drill press stands near a post at the head of my lathe. My lathe is a robust American beauty. It has a tilt-away tailstock, which gets that obstacle out of my way for some types of turning. That feature makes it easy to swing my leg over the lathe bed so I can get close to the action when hollowing a miniature vessel. I use a Wolverine jig for sharpening my tools and built this tall roll-around cart so I can sharpen tools without bending over or straining my neck to focus my bifocals. I store hones and other sharpening supplies in the drawers and my assortment of tool rests in the cabinet below. I recently upgraded this grinder with CBN wheels. I bought the ones with abrasive on the sides. That feature works perfectly for sharpening skews. Don't try that technique with standard sharpening stones as applying lateral force to a stone can cause it to fracture. You may think my lathe is the heart of my shop, but I think my table saw deserves that honor. I do a lot of flat work, plus all my segmented turning relies heavily on this tool. I made a large crosscut sled that includes slots for clamps to hold work in place. It's easy to remove the sled for ripping or for installing my wedgie sled for cutting segments. Let me show you how that device works. The angle guides are adjusted using plastic wedgies that perfectly set the angle between the guides. I then cut one end of a segment using one guide, then the other segment end is cut using the other guide. I made this simple sled for cutting tapers, specifically for making staves for my ribbon sculptures. Here's how it works.
Continuing around the room are some of my clamps and an old drafting table that works well for a work table. The Squish-O-Matic press that I use for clamping segmented bowl layers is at the right, and pieces for several unfinished projects take up the rest of the space on that tabletop. Here's my custom-made router table, my planer, and my scroll saw. On the wall above the scroll saw are more clamps. Those are hung on a French cleat system. More about that later. My marker board contains several important notices. My jointer is near the center of the room. And this is my drum sander, which is one of my favorite tools. Some of you have asked about this. I use it extensively for when flattening segmented rings. I've also used it a lot for sanding large glued up panels, as well as for reducing the thickness of flat stock. It's especially good for reducing the thickness of highly figured wood. A planer can cause a lot of chip out on burls and bird's eye wood, but this sander will not. I'll show you how it works. The drum inside is wrapped with a long strip of abrasive material and a moving belt feeds the work through the machine. Dust collection is a must, so the first thing you do after setting the desired thickness is to hook up the dust collector. Next, turn on the drum motor and then the feed belt. Turn off the dust collector last, allowing time for the dust to clear the pipes. These parts bins have been part of my shop for almost 40 years. I was really proud of them when I ordered 100 bins for only X dollars way back then. During this stay-at-home pandemic period, I decided to get better organized, and I even typed up labels for each bin to replace the hand-scribbled and sometimes obsolete or missing labels. Not only that, but I alphabetized them. Sounds silly, but it sure saves time if I'm looking for screw eyes or wing nuts, or some obscure part that I haven't used for many, many months. I even have bins for those precious things like Plastic things, comma, useful. That's an old family joke, by the way. Another shop organization step I took was to organize the dozens of power driver bits. It seems like I'm always getting a tool that includes a free assortment of screwdriver bits, and they always seem to end up dumped in a box someplace. I finally organized them in a plastic parts bin, which already has saved me time. I did some similar organization of sanding discs. I have an assortment of 3 inch, 2 inch, and 1 inch sanding discs that I use a lot for wood turning. Here I'm showing my 1 inch discs and how I keep them clean and easy to find. Earlier I mentioned the French cleat system used for my clamp rack. Here's a French cleat used to hang my official AAW wood turning smock. I installed French cleat boards at two levels all the way around the walls of my shop. Most things hang on just one of those two rails. My heavy parts bin rack and some of the other cabinets use both cleats to support the heavier weight. My wall cabinets all hang from French cleats, as do my pegboard panels and even this bandsaw blade rack. The flexibility is great, although my shop layout has pretty well stabilized and I rarely move things around much anymore. A word about ergonomics. Lighting is very important in a workshop. Dark walls and floors can really soak up even the brightest ceiling lights. 
That's why I painted the floors a light neutral color and sheetrocked and painted the walls to reflect light. It greatly improved the lighting level plus a painted concrete floor is much easier to sweep clean than is raw concrete. Finally, I recommend using anti-fatigue floor mats in front of your bench, lathe, or any tool at which you'll be standing for a period of time. Your legs and back will thank you for that. I hope you've enjoyed this virtual tour of my workshop and maybe even gotten some ideas for improving your own workspace. One side benefit to me has been that this project encouraged me to clean my shop to a level that I've rarely seen. Enjoy the creative process, and above all, stay safe.